are up. Yeah. All right, we're up. Hi, everybody, we're up. We just tried to do this a couple minutes ago and it didn't work. And now we are fully functioning, streaming on the beautiful World Wide Web. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Caitlin Becker at Fuse here with Jessica Nicole, who I know you recognize from other shows, but she is an activist. She is a wife, she is an artist, she is an actress. <laughs> She kind of does it all, and she is joining this amazing show, Underground, for season two, which premieres tonight. Yes. So you play Georgia. I play Tell Georgia. Tell me about Georgia. Georgia is the leader of a group called the Sewing Circle. Um, when people are introduced Which, by to the way, she's wearing a sewing pin right now because yes. she sewed her outfit herself. Because I sewed my outfit myself. I figure oh. this is the best kind of typecasting that I'm ever going to experience <laughs> is being cast as an actual sewer. Um, but Georgia has a group of friends that get together, and everyone thinks that you know they're doing needlework and talking about recipes and stuff, but they're actually going to the woods, and she's giving them target practice. She's showing them how to use guns. She's showing them how to defend themselves because these women are actually trying to join the movement to abolish slavery. So they're going out, they're protesting, they're handing out literature, but it's also a dangerous thing to do. And it's really cool to see a group of women, particularly in that period of time, that are feeling really empowered, that are using the privileges that they do have in whatever way that it is to actually be a part of the movement and work to help free everybody. And I think it's an important way to showcase a different uh, lens to view this history from. I mean, we who studied um, the history of the Underground Railroad are familiar with a few names, and we do get Harriet Tubman in the season. Yes. We do get Harriet Tubman, but we've seen this and we've read about this and studied it and learned it as children through one certain lens. And to see um, sort of art reflect the real lives and the real struggles and what the women of the day actually had to do it has to be an Absolutely. amazing project to be a part of. It, it really is because... Uh, you know, women get erased from the narrative so often uh, historically, and it's really unfair, and it's also not true. You know, we, we were a part of the movement. And so bringing Harriet Tubman in has been so exciting because obviously that's a historical figure that a lot of people have a relationship to, but we kind of see her as this like, you know, big, bigger than life kind of image. Iconic. Exactly. And she was a very real person with, you know, real relationships with people and her own flaws in some way. And so Underground really tries to bring that to light, which is cool. And the other thing that's so great about it is that you know, this story really runs parallel to what's happening in the world today, politically, obviously. Isn't that kind of scary? Yes, it is. I mean, we should be looking at this as look at look at what happened in the past and look at how far we've come, not look at how much further we have to go. Absolutely, but it's such a reminder that everything is so cyclical. And so when we were filming these scenes with the sewing circle, I remember thinking at the time when you know I was watching it later and the women's march had just happened and I thought, man, this was both prophetic and also a retelling of history time and time again. Like, you know, there's kind of nothing new under the sun, and this is still this is still something that we're struggling with. You know, for women to be able to have control of their bodies and to participate, you know, in trying to dismantle the patriarchy and everything. There, there's just so much to it, and so it really does feel nice to be a part of a show that's so relevant right now. It almost seems to me that when you first become an actor or an actress and you want to do this for your career, it's about make believe and it's about playing you know playing things that aren't real but this show is more important than ever to yeah. be aired at this time to be watched by these people who live in our culture today I mean as you've grown up in this industry has it become um, more of an advocacy role for you as well as a job I think you know it's it feels like a privilege to be able to even have these kinds of roles because I got to eat. I have bills to pay. And, you know, it's one thing to say, well, I'm only going to do stuff that's important to me and, you know, that, you know, has a high moral ground. You but at the same time, both. exactly, you want to be able to do both. And honestly, there have not always been that many projects that felt like it was, you know, both allowing me to create art but also have a voice and feel like I'm impacting the community in a positive way. So underground feels really special and specific because of that. And I have felt a bit of a shift. 
not that everything is like, you know, hunky dory and perfect in the industry or anything, but I think that I have seen, you know, some slow movement in the right direction where I feel like the communities that I am part of are represented on television. That I think is the beauty about art in all of its different forms, whether it's music or film or television or sculpture or painting, is that there's some that is there um, as a break, mm -hmm. there's some that is there solely to entertain mm -hmm. and to distract you and to enjoy, mm -hmm. and there's art that affects change and educates and to be able to live in a world where you can do all of those yeah. things is really important. <laughs> it is super important and really I feel like Underground kind of checks all of those boxes because it's an action thriller which you know is is kind of wild when you think about it because you don't think of that period of time being that way but then when you it's violent. really it's violent it, it's super super violent and there was so much at stake you know it's not violence for violence sake that is what our country was built on exactly and that is what so many people in various communities are still experienced today like black trans women and you know the whole black lives movement uh, black lives matter movement is about really showing the reality of how there's a disparity between the way that people of color and white people are treated in this country. And so again, the stories are just cycling. Like, you know, slavery still exists today. It just exists with different circumstances. It's manifested in a different way. But like, obviously the industrial prison complex is like one of the most obvious ways that we're seeing people who don't have ownership over their bodies, who are being made to participate in labor that they may or may not want to, I'm gonna say, do not want to participate in, you know, for, for little to no money at all. And they can't get out of it. And, you know, there's a reason that- You see that with sex work as well. Absolutely. With with sex trafficking, with migrant workers who are working on farms across the country and, you know, really don't have a way to get outside of what it is that they're doing in order to survive, take care of their family members who may or may not be living in the U.S. too. Like, it, it's so, it's like this huge snowball. And so it's just got different titles, you know, but it's, it's the same thing. And so that's another reason I think that Underground feels so important to show right now because everybody has... A relationship to it in some way even if you're not a person of color or if you're not a woman or if you're not any of these things you're still affected by it the people in your life are affected by it and if you're not if you don't check one of those boxes where you can relate to the oppressed yeah. in the show and it's uncomfortable to you for you to watch because you relate to the oppressors then you need to watch it even more yes exactly. it's even more important <laughs> for us to be you know Hiding from our history is never a good thing. Embracing, accepting, um, and changing mm -hmm. is the only way we can do that. Absolutely. It's just so important. Now, the topics, of course, are you know, are really deep. I mean, anyone who's watched the show, it's it can get really hard to watch yes. sometimes. And that's, those are the times where you need to really focus your attention. But what is that like to actually film? I was really nervous about that because when I had seen the first season, and particularly particularly I think it's episode seven called Cradle which is about the kids in that period of time really did a number on me it was it was really difficult to watch it it well, just you breaks your the, heart you watch these two little boys who went from being playmates yes. to sort of a master and a slave relationship and they Absolutely. were seven years old and it shows how it shows like the generational effects of slavery during that period of time and then how it just trickles down to, you know, to the future, essentially. So the first season, I thought it was really difficult and I was nervous going into the show thinking, you know, what what is it like on set? Like, are you just depressed and, and feeling, you know, beat down the whole time? And what I found out was there is some of that. My first day on location, actually, we our van pulled up to this park where we were shooting at and there's this big platform that's built and there are four black actors with nooses around their necks. And it was also weird because... You know it's not real, but that imagery in front of you, you can't ignore it. You. Yeah. Absolutely. And we also have like all these tourists in Savannah probably walking up like, okay, what is going on right now? You know, like it really, it just takes you to another place and it makes you have this really visceral reaction. And so I think because of that, the actors and the crew tried to keep it Bring light, some you know, in the situation you've got as, to. as much as possible. And sometimes that was harder than others. And also speaking of, you know, as, as a woman that was in this show wearing these costumes that are like 30 pounds in the heat, in the heat, because we're filming, we started in filming in Georgia August. Heat? Oh, and this was just every day, you know, like this was this 
this was not new to the people who Ooh. were living these lives. So that was like a very superficial reaction to what it was going through. And that's like not even counting the emotional stuff that you're going through. But it was, it, it was okay. I think that everybody knew that we were there to be in service to the stories. And I feel like for the most part, everybody's ego was really taken out of it in a way that I haven't worked on a project like that before, where we're telling a story that feels so important and personal that you know you kind of just throw all the other stuff away, the discomfort, you get past it and you just show up to do the work that you can do because it's a big deal. Do we know or can you tell me if Georgia makes it into next season or makes it through this season? You probably can't tell I me. actually wish that I knew. Mm, that's got to be hard. It's really hard. There, There's so much to this character. Like, she's got so many layers to her. So I, I would love for her to come back so that we can learn more about her and see all the stuff that she's capable of. But I can tell you that by the end of the season, she is in dire straits. That's all I'll say. Okay. <laughs> How was working with the cast? I know that sometimes joining a show after they already have their relationships already sort of worked out, it's like going to a new school. Yeah. Where you have to sort of make friends. I mean, you have, obviously, you're so familiar with Aldous and Journey and, and sort of watching their progression in their relationship on screen. But you come into these, this thing and these people work together every day for a long time. I mean, yeah. how did you get embraced by the cast? It's like being a stepchild. Like, you're walking into a family that's already established. And so my thing is to just, like, stay on the side and not ruffle any feathers and just wait till somebody comes and invites me. <laughs> you know, to sit with them at the lunch table or something. But they they were so nice. They were so warm. And again, Again, most of my work this season is with Just a Cow. And we like really hit it off immediately. She was lovely. We actually had apartments right across the street from each other and we would go out for coffee. I taught her how to knit and she knit these like beautiful scarves for the whole set. <laughs> I was so proud of her. She's like my best pupil ever. Um, but everybody was really, really lovely and happy to have new faces, I think, you know, in the show. The, the storylines don't always intersect. So there were some people that obviously, like, I totally never, like, I saw them at the halfway party. We had a halfway party, like, to celebrate that we made it that far. And I, like, lost my mind dancing. And I was like, hey, haven't seen you since we did the photo shoot in the beginning of the season. What's going on? <laughs> like, <laughs> that was kind of my relationship with half the cast. But... You know, when I got to work with Alano, who I just really love his character. He plays Kato on the show. We might actually be getting him on in a couple of weeks. Oh, that so would be so stages. awesome. He's he's amazing, and his character's so good because another thing that I really love about this show is that they don't write one-dimensional characters. So even their bad guys aren't all bad, and their good guys aren't all good. You know, they're they're really multi-dimensional they're real. people. They're real. People aren't like that. Exactly. And that's another thing that I find missing from a lot of quote-unquote slave narratives in general is that it's like, you know, all white people bad, mm -hmm. all black people good. And, you know, and then there's also like this other dynamic of the white savior that comes in. It's like the one white person that's good. It just didn't happen. It's way too complicated for it to be so, you know, literally black and white. white. Like, <laughs> it really is. Yeah. And that's oftentimes how our history books are written. They're written with the facts and you don't get into the details and the nuances of what made these people people. Absolutely. And to understand the psychology and the emotions of, of the time, you need to understand people. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a question coming in okay. that does actually talking about Fringe. Uh, what was it like working with J.J. Abrams on Fringe? Of course, <laughs> Fringe fans will recognize Jessica from the show. I was Astrid on the show. Um, I actually only saw JJ like four times in the really? five years that we thought he's a busy man. <laughs> like he was always doing like a couple of TV shows and he had movies that were in the works. And so he would come up and be like, Hey everybody, we'd be like JJ. And then he would be gone. He was like Santa Claus kind of. <laughs> I saw him like that once a year. It has to maybe be a little bit easier because when you're working for someone that at that level, Having them there, breathing down your neck all the time, Absolutely. would probably freak me out. It was a, it, it was a lot of pressure, and he was like, I mean, he was just so nice, probably because he wasn't having to hang around all the time while we're shooting for like seventeen hours a day. So he was very lovely when I got to to hang out with him, but he was so busy, he just wasn't around a lot. <laughs> Another show that, of course, in Shondaland, that all of our TGIT fans, yeah, are 
aware of you in is, of course, is Huck's wife. Yeah. And Scandal. What is it like working on Scandal? Oh, my God. One of the craziest shows on television. That show was a dream. Guillermo is a dream. He plays Huck on the show. I played his wife. And that's another show where it was like, okay, I'm just coming in to do my work. I'm not trying to, like, <laughs> get in the mix or anything. Because actors can be really weird about stuff like that sometimes. But this show, like Carrie Washington, I really didn't get to do any scenes with her. I would just meet her in passing, but she's just so cool. Like she's so- She also looks like a walking angel. I know. She actually looks like a walking angel that Honestly, fell from the sky. She is just so gracious and classy and like, I just want to be like her. Like, I want to exude the kind of confidence, but also warmth. Like, she was really lovely to me and came up to me and said, you know, we're so happy that you're on the show. And it was sincere. So I, I really love that. And so Shonda was a fan of Fringe, which I think is hysterical because how does Shonda have time to watch, watch TV. any television at all? But she was a, a fan of Fringe, and that's why she brought me onto the show to play this, you know, recurring role that I played for a few seasons, and I loved it. I had such a good time there. That has to be fun when there's a show like that that you get to sort of pop in and out of and be a part of but not have to commit your entire life to. It has to be a ton Absolutely. of fun. Absolutely. And Guillermo's character's amazing. It's, and it's so such good. A, it was such a bizarre relationship that you two had where it was... There was that huge separation. I mean, you thought yeah. he was dead. For 10 years. And then, and he's so weird, yeah. but so, like, loving. It's, yeah. It had to be just a delight to play. It really was. And I was so excited to see his character kind of evolve in that way. And that's another good person, I think, who's writing really great characters. Again, there's nobody that's all good or all bad. And, you know, Guillermo's character, you love him. And he's... He's Bananas. The, he's the worst. He's he the rips, worst at he the same cuts time. He actually limbs off and drills into their body with power drills. I know. But you're like, oh, I love Huck. I totally hang out with Huck. It's great. Right. That's kind of how you feel when you're watching the show. And I feel like that's pretty powerful writing to get the audience in the palm of your hand like that. And you're like, I can give them anything I want. They'll still be there because that's what, that's what happens, actually. Now, if you guys are listening right now, there's a good chance that you just recognize your voice. Oh, if you're podcasting fans, Alice Isn't Dead. Yeah. You are the voice for Alice Isn't Dead. What an incredible podcast. I'm a big podcast fan. I love to listen to them when I clean or when I'm in the car. And this is a, a serialized fiction, and we're just getting into season two. Yes. How did, how did this happen? This happened because there's another podcast called Welcome to Night Vale, and it has like a massive following, and I had played um, a character that kind of comes in and out. Um, her name is Dana, and she started out as an intern and ended up becoming the mayor of this like fictionalized city. But because uh, Joseph and Jeffrey and I had worked together on Night Vale, um, Joseph said that he would like to work with me again. People say that all the time. It doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> but it actually manifested into something real. And so he sent me, like, I think he sent me the first maybe two scripts. And I thought, I mean, I think it's amazing. Like, let's do it. I'll go inside of my closet, literally inside of my closet, which is where I record this podcast. That's where I used to record videos when I did Are entertainment you things. Yeah, I, I, as an entertainment news reporter, I would sit on the floor of my closet with the thing plugged into my computer. Oh, my because God. the closet, you have all the clothes to you bounce have the, clothes. the sound. That's exactly right. That's exactly it's, where I it's record. It's perfect. And so that's where that's where I will go, and I'll sit there for like two hours, and my legs are dying by the time I get out, and they're all stiff. But I've and I've amongst got my the green shoes. apple amongst the shoes and the winter coats that I never wear in this city because it's never that cold. <laughs> <laughs> There's something I find so fascinating about podcasts, particularly good and successful ones. There, it, it podcasting the medium is so democratized. Mm -hmm. So, like you said, you can record. You could buy a mic for sixty bucks on Amazon that plugs into your computer and you record in your closet. Mm -hmm. But the content it has to be done the same way that you would do for a film or a television. I feel like people think just because anybody can physically do a podcast, anybody can do a podcast. I mean, a lot of work has to go into those scripts, and and you probably have to bring the same sort of skills in a different way that you bring on camera because you don't have the visual. You have to rely solely on your voice. Absolutely. And that's really scary, to be honest with you. Like, when I first started, I was excited to come on board, but I, I just was nervous that I wasn't going to be able to do justice to it because you're right. You have to emote a lot with your voice, 
And, um, you know, I had done like a few voiceover things prior to that, but nothing, nothing this big and for this long. It's one thing to do like a Bud Light spot, you know, for your voiceover agent and they pick it up or whatever. And it's three sentences, but this is literally hours. I love the hours. idea that you would do a Bud Light spot. I don't, I don't know why that one just came into Have you done either. work any work with certain brands that we would know? I've done a few McDonald's spots before. So here's another You're loving thing. It. I get it. I, I love it. I've also loving done it. a McDonald's commercial where I'm like eating a breakfast burrito. That's from way back in the day. But so here's the other thing about voiceover is that there's like a lot of weird stuff in terms of um, racialized casting that comes into it too. And so for a while when I was in New York City living, all the voiceover stuff that I would get, they would like put me in for like urban mom or urban teen or whatever. And that's not so much what my voice sounds like, but they would see me and they were like, well, we got to send her in for it. Meanwhile, I wasn't getting sent in for just like regular suburban mom who may or may not be white. Like I, I just sound more that like that. that distinction has to be made that regular suburban mom has to sound has like a to, white mom. Exactly. That's and an what urban it was. mom has to sound like a black mom or a Latina mom. That's what it is, that there's no ambiguity in the voiceover, in the commercial voiceover world so much. So I just never, I guess I always thought, well, maybe I'm terrible at voiceovers because it would also feel weird to go in there and be like saying these words and talking in this sassy voice because sometimes I would book and they'd be like, can you do it a little bit sassier? A little bit sassier? So now I'm from Jersey. Sassy voice is how I would learn to talk. <laughs> That's how they raise us in Atlantic City. Right. Sassy voice. See, when they tell you go sassy, that means one like, thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know I'm there. Right. But when they, tell, tell, and you when they tell me to go sassy, I it's know like that that's a polite that way of saying, you know, we want you blacker. to sound blacker. That's exactly what it was. So it was really frustrating for me. So another reason that Alice um, Isn't Dead was so cool is that I didn't have to like make my voice sound a certain way or worry about you know not hitting the demographic that they're trying to reach. I could just sound like myself. And so, and that's the thing, like black people don't sound a certain way. White people don't sound a certain way. You know, the, the, yeah. we gotta give a lot of space to be fully realized humans from different backgrounds. It's just a, such a simple thing, but to yeah. think that it is such a simple concept that not everybody sounds the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, just like not everybody looks the same. It's da -da -da. Like, not that hard to kind of grasp, but when you're trying to cast things, you're trying to narrow people down, I can get that. Yeah. Like, that's how we've gotten here. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So, needless to say, I have not had a lucrative career in commercial voiceover work. But I have been able to do podcasting, which has been great. Um, I've been voicing some cartoon characters. Like, I got to do Adventure Time, a few, uh, like, last year, which was awesome because it's such a great, great show. And it was a really cool storyline. And I'm doing a video game that I'm not allowed to say what the name of it is. But that was really fun. <laughs> I love the way in the beginning of the, our conversation you were talking about having to, the ability to kind of balance out the types of projects that you do. Mm -hmm. And it seems that you're doing that so you can have just like such a wide range of types of work and, and sort of what that means for you. Because something serious is physically and emotionally draining. And so Absolutely. to be able to do a cartoon has to level you out a little bit. It, t it totally does. And I feel like, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, you know, and I feel like I'm just now starting to really create the career that I always imagined for myself. And that does not necessarily mean tons of money, you know, although that would be lovely too. <laughs> Um, but a lot of it is, like you said, balancing it out, making sure that you're doing projects that feel creatively fulfilling while still being able to pay your bills, um, creating your own content. Like me and my friends got together and made this movie called Suicide Kale. We made it over five days in my house and it won the audience award at Outfest. Like we never anticipated that it would actually do anything because it, it was just such a like, let's just do this thing for five days for fun because we have nothing else to do. But that... That's it. Like that's that's what makes you fulfilled in this industry. And when you have a nice balance of those things, including sewing, which is like a really therapeutic thing for me to oh, do. Yeah, we talked about this when we thought we were up before. <laughs> Jessica made her whole outfit. Yeah. How freaking impressive is that? <laughs> <laughs> so impressive. You're so sweet. Thank you very well, much. Well, not a lot of people can do that. And then do all of the other things that you do. And you authored a book. 
I did. I um, am an illustrator, and so I had been asked to contribute a comic for this book about, um, it's called Queer, the letter Q, queer writers coming out to their younger selves. So my comic was about me as a teenager, kind of like tiptoeing around the possibility that I might be identifying as a queer person and being really afraid of that because I am from Birmingham, Alabama, and I look the way that I do, and I had never seen or even really read about anybody that looked like me and, you know, was like me. And so it was a really, really scary thing. And I just kind of like put it to the side and was like, okay, well, I guess I'm not going to deal with that. And it took me years to get to, it took me after living in New York for a while, actually, to get to a place where I was like, oh no, there are people who were living successful, happy lives, you know, that are out and, and queer and have brown skin and they're okay. And they're just doing their thing. And they're just doing, like, they're not walking around thinking, oh gosh, I'm all these things, is it okay? And so that was the first time I think that I could envision a future for myself where I could be a part of those communities and that it would be okay. Like, okay with myself. Who cares what, who, you know, how other people felt about it, but if I could be okay with it, that would be a big deal. And, and that's what happened. And so that comic feels really special to me because I never really, I don't know, thought about it too much until I had been asked to contribute. And I, so I sat down and I drew it and I was like, it was just pouring out of me. And I was like, oh, well, this is a story clearly that I've been wanting to tell for a long time. Creativity just comes gushing. <laughs> yeah, in. just gushing. Oh, okay. All right. We're, we're there. <laughs> that's exactly right. Jessica, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. And guys, tonight, Underground, you guys are going to be live tweeting. Yes, Isn't we will be live tweeting. You can touch base with the fans and the people who are watching in real time. It's really cool. And I'm very glad that I've already watched the episode because I've also live tweeted with episodes I haven't watched and I was like hold on what's happening oh wow that was really great like that part is really really hard so this will be really fun because I actually know what's going on thank you so much for joining us thank you and make sure you're tuning in tonight to underground also have your phone there so that you can live tweet with the cast and thank you guys for joining us